Radio Show. Everyone, welcome once again to the 25th Hour Radio Show. This is Kevin Huntsperger from WSIL TV and KevinHunsBlogger.com, along with Tom Harness from Harness Digital Marketing. Tom, once again, uh, Rob has hit a home run with us, and the Classic Rock Showcase continues with another fantastic guest. You know, I'm I'm 43. You're obviously way older than me. Yeah, way, like, way. What four months? Five months? Yeah. You're just you're still you're older than me. There was something really unique about growing up in the 80s that everybody really enjoyed, and a lot of it was just the music. Yes. And and one of it was this whole this rock revolution, this glam revolution. It was just a whole different thing that was in your face. And today, we get to uh, get the the honor of one of the. Well, I'm just going to say it. She was beautiful. She was hot. She was Roxy from Vixen. Well, you're saying was. Oh, is. now. Is. Is. She still is. Absolutely. <laughs> she still is. 43. How can you guys say 43 when I'm only 28? <laughs> <laughs> because you found some way to do Time Machine. Like when you're an established rocker, I think it's all the fun, the singing, and all the other stuff that keeps you ageless. Right, Roxy? Well, that's what rock and roll is about. There is no age in rock and roll. You don't age in rock and roll. And I love that. And you know what? I've seen. I've seen your photos, and they are absolutely – you won. You are still rocking it. You're still beautiful. You you could – I mean, we're both married guys, but I got to tell you, uh, I, I had a big I had a big crush on a lot of the glam glam ladies back in the day, so. Oh, cool. He had a brief thing with Poison, too, but that's that's another story for another episode. But, uh, well, you know, we, we got confused with Poison many, many times. <laughs> well, kind of walk but us back in those old days. They were beautiful. Yes, and, and tell us a little bit about the, the whole evolution of, of Vixen and, and how you guys got your start, and then we'll, we'll kind of progress through what you're doing today with your projects. Sure. Um, the original guitarist, Jane Kiedemann, who um, she passed away in 2013, but she started the band back in um, Minnesota with her friend. She put a girl, her girlfriends together. They formed a band. They worked their way out to L.A., and they went through member changes through the years, and... Um, uh, I joined in 85, and um, shortly thereafter, we uh, came to deal with um, EMI Records. Now, I, I, I'm kind of just putting it on in a nutshell. There was a lot of, you know, work in the clubs and doing all the flyers and all the parties, the network. I mean, it was just the 80s. The 80s was, it was a lifestyle. It was bigger than life. You had a blast. And uh, that's why music is still around today. The 80s music is still, I mean, it, it just brings you back to when things were great and fun. And it's all about the music. But yeah, so, um, yeah, I joined in 85. We got a deal in 86, 87. And um, we released the record, Edge of a Broken Heart, uh, our first, yeah, that was the first single. And um, it actually did very, very well. It was written by Richard Marks. Saw play and inspired him to write that song, and that put Vixen on the worldwide map. And we sold um, a million worldwide. We toured for years and opened for some of the big heavyweights like Deep Purple and Ozzy and Kiss and Bon Jovi and you name it. We, we did a lot of shows with them. And um, where did you guys want me to stop? Well, you know, if you don't mind me asking, like that genre of rock and those 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 bands that you named, um, you know, it, it's a reputation of being a man's world. So was it, and I, I don't want to turn this into a, a politically correct thing by any means, and, and I hope I don't offend you by asking this, but were there challenges in that time period uh, being a female rock band? Because it really, there weren't a whole lot, or at least in, in my recollection, this was middle school and, and early high school days, of, of a lot of female rock bands like Vixen. No, there weren't. There weren't. In fact, you know, all my influences were, were male, like Zeppelin and Sabbath. But um, we didn't care. We, we just wanted to rock. Uh, you know, we knew we had the goods. So we went out, we played the clubs just like the guys and did everything we needed to do to get our name out there. Uh, you know, we didn't care if they uh, tell we just didn't care. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't about girl or guy. It was about putting out some good music and being a cool rock band. Um, it just it took long uh, to earn credibility, but we did because we delivered the goods live. We, you know, there, so we even got accused of playing tapes in the background. 
and it wasn't. So we, we did everything live, the vocals, everything. There was none of that. So, yeah, there was, you know, we had to do everything. We were under a microscope. It was kind of like, um, not only can you play drums, but can you do a flip while you're playing the drums? Can you totally stick and flip? It's just, it's like, it felt like we had to work twice as hard. But, it, like I said, it didn't matter. It was what we did, and we just played with a take no prisoners attitude. If the boys can't keep up, well, we won't hold it against them. So there, there was really no pressure from the record label for them to basically say, hey, we want you to look this way and we want you to do this. You literally pretty much oh, drove oh, that. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, there was. Yeah, there was. Yeah. Um, we, we just said, blow it out your ass. And that's the way you rock it, right? That's the way you rock it. Yeah. We are who we are. We wanted to dress up. We wanted to wear makeup. We wanted to do all that. We didn't need to be told to do that. But, you know, you'd have guys saying, well, you know, can you... You know, we, we want more of a popular band. Well, that's not who we are, so go find somebody else. Okay, so I've got to ask this. You know how the rock bands have groupies? You know, did you guys have your own guy groupies? <laughs> you want to be a groupie? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to lie. I mean, if, as long as we'll, we'll edit this part out so my wife doesn't get a little bit jealous. But uh, <laughs> but no, I just, I'm really curious. No, yeah, sure we did. Yeah, of course we did. They, they followed us and they did all that. But they weren't. Like, girl groupies take the clothes off and throw them on stage. Although one guy did take his underwear off and throw it on stage, and it ended up on my drum stand. And nobody wanted to touch that. Yeah, it, it doesn't quite have the same... It doesn't have the same appeal, does it? No, not tiny whiteies. Um, uh, they were more... Actually, they were more respectful towards us, and they were more... Um, I don't know. They just... They were nervous when they would talk to us. If we, if we were, you know... Like leaving the bus to go to the venue, what they're always waiting there with a million things for us to sign, like records and pictures. And they were just mainly polite. We just took pictures with them. Um, you know, you you get the occasional guys who would, you know, when we were playing the clubs, one guy wrote a little note and gave it to Jan, and it said something like, "I'm the venue tonight." And then it proceeded to write all her body parts on it. Okay. <laughs> you know, that's crazy stuff. But it's all fun. It's all good. So now it's, it's evolved. So the 80s, obviously, we're out of the 80s, goes into the 90s. The band um, kind of disbands, re, uh, re-picks yeah. back up. And then yep. these transformations of the band, you're going into different genres. You're getting, you're competing with different, uh, different demographic. How has it changed from the 80s to the 90s to now into the 2000s with your following? Are you, are you getting new followers? Not only are we getting the old followers, but we're getting the older followers with their kids. We bring their kids to the shows. So there is a new generation that is totally turned on to the 80s rock. So that, that tells you a lot. And you know, you... This you music and this lifestyle, that lifestyle, it stood the test of time. People miss it. And, and you hit on it. I think it is. There was something unique about the lifestyle of the 80s because it combined, you know, fashion and... Uh, this I don't give a crap attitude. I think that's why when you go into the '90s, where you get the grunge, you get a little bit of that. But it was there was no fashion. It was more of like an emotional statement. But in the '80s, it combines so much of just just of everything pop culture. Like it it culminated into everything: TV, radio, music. Oh yeah, like I said, it was it was just a, it was a lifestyle, and you know, all good things must come to an end. I mean, you, you couldn't keep that up forever, right? So it's just weird how the pendulum swung completely the opposite way, where it was these guys went on stage now with, uh, you know, flannel, and they were looking down on their guitars, and they looked like they wanted to, you know, they didn't want to be up there. But some good music came out of the 90s with Stone Temple Pilots and, you know, um, Soundgarden. I mean, it's some really good stuff. Um, but I prefer the 80s, you know, straight ahead, rock, just happy, you know, when you go to a show, you want to, you want to see a show, and, and those bands put on a show, like Kiss and Bon Jovi, I think it's all about the show, it's bigger than life, you want to, you want to go to a concert, and you want to just leave going, wow, that was really cool. Yeah, it really, it, it, it's show business, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, absolutely, and I, that's one of the things that I loved and, and remember still about the 80s, but we were talking earlier, it, it's all kind of evolved and come full circle, and you have some other projects that are in the works right now. 
Uh, can you talk to us a little bit more about Madam X and, and Monstrosity and, and what you're doing with that? Right, right. Well, okay, it took us about 100 years to finish this record, but we're, we're done. And it was mixed by the legendary Michael Wagner. And uh, actually, Mark Slaughter mixed two or three of the songs, three of the songs. And uh, he's finishing those up. They're going to be mastered. We're looking at um, hopefully releasing it in August or September. We have, we're going to do everything ourselves. We record everything ourselves, but it looks like we have some record company interest, but we'll see where that goes. Um, we're uh, thinking about shooting a video, maybe possibly next month. So we have a lot of good things happening with Madam X. In fact, we're doing the Monster Rock Cruise in 2018. And um, the VIP After Show, that is a project that Maxine, and my sister Maxine and I, we started writing music that wasn't necessarily right for Vixen or Madam X. And uh, we just started writing, and, uh, you know, I was... Uh, on the, on the road with Vixen when uh, I came up with Kilmister. And uh, I just was thinking about Lemmy and I started writing lyrics. Luck is for suckers, turn my heart to a spade, the blacker the oil, makes my motor rage. I'm going, that is Lemmy, that is Lemmy. Basically, it's a love song. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't those true enough words? Those, those lyrics are amazing, and I, like I said, I, I came in the office prepping this morning for the interview, and I plugged that in, and I put it on repeat, and I was... I was jamming out, and then, uh, of course, my team came in, and they're, they're millennials, and they probably thought they, that I was something was wrong with me or there was something wrong with my music. But I'm jamming out, and, and it was, it was, I loved it. It took me back, man. I, I just, it was really good. It was fun. Well, you know, I, I'm a big fan of Lemmy's lyrics. I studied his lyrics, and I just, you know, I dig it. I dug, you know, I totally dig him. He's just, Lemmy was the real deal. And he was really inspiring to me, so... I just started writing this song, and then um, I uh, called my friend Chris Bates, who is also a keyboard, he's a keyboardist and guitarist, and he came up with the, uh, the music to it. And it just kind of organically came together, and then um, uh, Mark Slaughter was cool enough to sing it, he really dug the tune, he's like, oh yeah, this is total Lemmyism. And it, it came to be together, and I'm just really pretty proud of it. I just wish Lemmy was alive, too. Let me know if he dug it or not. You probably know that he, he's probably digging it, though, man. I mean, those rock legends and gods, they know. They know. Yeah, yeah. I hope so. So, yeah. So, uh, we released that. That is available at all digital downloads right now. You can pick that up. And then we also have a tune called Full Metal Jacket that Maxine and I wrote with Mark Slaughter singing. Um, these two songs will be released on vinyl, a 12-inch vinyl. Coming soon, uh, it'll be an import. It's available in Europe. You'll have to order it in America, but that's coming soon too. So I am pretty excited. You know, and it's I'm a motorized, motorized. <laughs> you should be, and it's really cool from from our our standpoint to see records make this comeback of of just being important. The sound, it, it's just you get, there's more of a connection with it when you play those those LPs, man. It's just, oh yeah, yeah. I mean. Remember the days going to the record store and just flipping through all those records? I mean, it, part of it was the artwork. You just look at it and go, wow, what a cool album. And it's like, then it's, it's tangible. It's in your hand. And you can put it on the turntable. And it sounds good. You know what I mean? It's just really, I mean, it, again, that's making it come back too. So it, it just tells you right there. Yeah, those, those live albums that you can get from those recordings, LP, those are amazing. There, nothing nothing oh, comes yeah. close to that. I was going to ask yep, you, as yep. a musician, you, you, when the evolution of music came and, and the way that it was produced, you know, from eight tracks to uh, cassette tapes to vinyl to DV, or to CDs and, and now digital downloads, I mean, obviously, uh, we're seeing kind of a, a resurgence, as you mentioned, in the vinyl. As a musician, though, does that have an impact on you uh, on a personal level of, of seeing this kind of change and you know, obviously the access and the way people get music has, has changed a lot over the last decade or so. Well, they have more access to it on the Internet, so that is a good thing about the Internet. You can just pull up anything, go to YouTube, you can see an old Judge Hotel concert, you can see Dixon, wherever. I mean, that, in that sense, that's a good thing. Uh, but then in the other sense, it's just kind of like, it's, it's just the attention span. Like five minutes and they're on to something else. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't have, where, where it was more of a, 
I don't know, more mysterious and, and just, it was different. It was different back in the day. It just, it just takes, it's taken me a minute to get used to this, this information age and overwhelming information. But um, I'm just happy that people want to hear the music that I'm making. And as long as they keep buying it and encourage me, I'll keep doing it because I'm inspired and I love what I do. You talked so I will to- keep doing it. You talked about how you had to beat the streets and go to bars, and you probably did some of the same thing, sold uh, albums and cassette tapes out of the back of a car and just carry everything. With this social media revolution, and I know that you know, you're know you on social media, you've got presence, do you think that it would have been easier if you would have had this today back then to get the name out there, or would it have been more competitive for you guys to compete in this digital area? It definitely would have been more competitive, but if you you got the goods, it's going to trans, transcend that. I mean, people, people latch on. When it's good, they latch on to it. If it's crap, it's just on to the next, on to the next. Uh, definitely would have helped. Yeah, you, because, I mean, we were out on the pavement put, put posters up on telephone poles and all that, and which which was fun. We had a great time doing it. You met a lot of people, and you were in there with the fans and talking to them and stuff, too. So all that is good. I, you know, eye to eye. Getting in, mixing in with the people versus sitting behind the computer. And, you know, you know, the computer. You can do what you want, make up what you want too. I mean, people hide behind the computer. You don't know what the hell's going on there. But um, it's all about the music. Yeah, but, yeah. Getting you, it out there is you know, the social media. Uh, I guess we compare it back in, in when Vixen was was beating the streets. Is you know. Uh, the person says, hey, did you hear about Vixen? Let me mix you this tape. And here, listen to this tape and see it. And then people would go buy the actual tape because the mix tapes were never that great. But that was the whole social media thing there was the sharing was literally you making these tapes and sharing that music with people. That's right. It was word of mouth. Word of mouth. Like Miss Metallica when they first started out. I mean, they just exploded. It was an underground scene. And it was just that metal scene, that hard rock metal underground. I mean, that they dictate, the fans dictate what's going to be big, what's not. Not the record companies. Record companies just churn out, you know, clones. That's why they're obsolete. It's these original bands and, and, and bands that write music that they, they love and they stay true to their music. Fans know it. They can, they can spot a phony and they can spot the new phone in it in. Talk a little bit more about that persistence and, and pursuing a dream and I know that, it, you know, schools today, we're seeing cuts to the arts programs. Uh, music and band are often on the chopping block in a lot of places. Uh, obviously, music was a big influence in your life growing up and, and got you to where you are today. But talk to me a little bit about that, the importance of music at, at an early age, but also then that importance of once you have that dream, not letting anyone talk you out of it and, and pursuing it. Well, it, it has to start with you. I mean... I just kind of, I just kind of knew. I mean, it was introduced to me, of course, through my family because I come from a family musician. But once I started playing and seeing the bands like Black Sabbath and all these and uh, Judas Priest things like that, I just was hooked, and I knew that's what I want to do. There was no stopping. I mean, I was just hooked. But as far as let me just say this: um, last week I went to a masterclass concert. And it was these young kids, there were maybe, you know, they were all the way down to like six, five years old, all the way up to 16 years old. And they were playing an 80s hair band show. And this was through a music studio here locally, where, I, where I'm from, Michigan. And these kids were playing Europe, Journey, Van Halen, Warren, Def Leppard, Motley Crue, Twisted Sister, and they were nailing it. And we're talking little kids. So... There's hope. <laughs> There's hope for this new generation. I was just so, uh, you know, just optimistic. It's like, wow, you know, this is a great thing that these music studios are, are introducing, reintroducing the 80s rock. These kids are learning it on their instruments, and, they're, and they like it. I mean, they were headbanging. It was totally cool. Yeah. One of the girl bands played Edgar Broken Heart. That's why I went. Oh, that's awesome. They knew I was coming, and I came, and they, the little girls, they just froze. It was so cute. You know, oh. like, you know, take the bath, and they were great. <laughs> I posted it. Posted it on my page. 
So Kevin and I both have, we have 11 year old daughters. It just worked out that way that we're, our kids are the same age. And whenever we have female guests, we always ask them, what advice would you give for young ladies, young, young women today as they go through and do those dreams and want to go into music and arts and all that? And just in general, what, what advice do you have for those young girls? I would say they need to practice, practice, play as much as you can, get as good as you can on your instrument, because the looks and all that, that, you know, that is fine, that'll get you the attention, but after that, it's the goods, can you deliver? I mean, they have to have a passion for it, they really need to want to do it, they have to be disciplined, you have to be disciplined, and the music comes first, make sure you... You know, it's all about the music. Get good at the music. Get out there and play. Play more. Play often. Just keep playing because that's how you're going to get in tune with what uh, uh, the fans want and you get comfortable on stage. And it's all building your career. You've got to start at the bottom. There's no, you know, the voice and all those things. You know, you just start up. That's rare. I mean, if you want longevity, you got to really pay your dues. Got to work hard and hustle. Work hard and hustle. That's the way I was taught. It's the way we grew up, for and sure. Absolutely. Is, is there anything else you want to say as we kind of wrap up in our closing moments here? Uh, any social media plugs you want to give that, that folks can find you guys? Oh, yeah. They can, well, I'm, I'm, so not, I'm really not that good at social media. I'm still trying to get, you know, get the swing of things. But, yeah, they can, we have a big Facebook page. They can, um, uh, web page, Madamax, you can find it. You just punch it in, we're there. You're going to find it. I'm on, I have my own page, Maxine has her own page. You know, we're all over the place. Yeah, I sent you a friend request, so hopefully uh, after this interview I will get approved, so that'll be nice. Now that you know oh, me. Block you. Oh! <laughs> no, I'm just we all do. <laughs> I enjoyed our conversation, and I want to thank everybody, all the fans on there. And we'll plug your social media accounts too. And you know, we need to give another plug for something here. I, I, if you're looking for your next video for a gray-haired 44-year-old man and a bald 44, 40-year-old man to get that demographic, give us a call. We'll see if we can't come out and and be in that that next vi that next video. That'd be awesome. Oh yeah, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, this next video we do is going to be about monstrosity, so we can use you guys. There you go. Awesome. I'll wear my I love like I'll wear my I love my wife t-shirt and you can wear your uh, Smurf t-shirt. There you there go. There you go. There's nothing more <laughs> rock and roll than that. <laughs> uh, that's cool. I'll give you my t-shirt. Uh, drummers do it better on bare skin. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> you like that? Yeah, I would do I would wear I would wear that one. I would definitely wear that one. All right, Roxy, no thank you so much for being a part of the 25th Hour Classic uh, Music Showcase this week. My pleasure. Thank you, guys, and hope to see you on the road. That would be great. All right, rock on. Rock on. Bye-bye. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye. Well, Tom, another great interview here on the 25th Hour Radio Show. Um, I've got some T-shirts on the way. There you go. <laughs> that would be so much fun to be some middle-aged men in a vixen or Madam X, uh, Madam X uh, video. And Michigan's not that far. I, and they've got beer. We could road trip. They've got craft beer there, so we could definitely do that. Well, you know, the one thing that everybody connects with is, is music as we get older. We kind of go back to that. Uh, our kids are going to connect with the music that they hear today. Absolutely. My wife connects with the music that she heard back when she was growing up. So what's great is that, again, it was a, such a pop culture sensation that it, it culminated everything from just fashion and clothing and everything and this band was absolutely at the forefront of that. They sure did. They led the way. And uh, as she mentioned, you know, one of the very few, if only, female rockers. You know, obviously there were other female performers out there, female bands, but uh, nothing quite like Vixen. No, not at all. The only other person that really stood out for me uh, during the 80s that was a female kind of a rocker was, was Lita Ford. I was going to say Lita Ford would be the only other one that comes to mind. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it was our pleasure to speak with Roxy. And as mentioned, be sure to check her out as well as Madam X, Vixen. Uh, just search them in your, uh, throw them in your Google machine, as they say, and uh, you'll definitely find them. And we'll plug them online as well.
That's right. And uh, I guess we're going to get ready to wrap things up and say goodbye as well. Tom, anything else you want to add before we say goodbye? No, as always, we want to thank uh, Rob for having us. And this was a really uh, amazing showcase to be able to have Roxy and Vixen on, on this. That's right. You had to definitely add them into the mix for sure. Well, for Tom Harness from Harness Digital Marketing, I'm Kevin Huntsberger from KevinHunsBlogger.com. Have a great week and thanks for listening to the 25th Hour Radio Show.